Hey everyone, I am Donovan Brown and we are now in the adopter panel. So we're gonna be talking to people who have been adopting Dapper in production and running it already. This is gonna be a great opportunity for you to ask questions about what their experience was like when they went on this journey to adopt Dapper. So what I'd like to do now is give everyone an opportunity to introduce themselves. We'll start with Russell and then we'll go around. Just tell us what company you're, you're with and your name and that'd be great. Hi everybody, I'm Russell Stather from Ignition Group. Uh, we're based down in South Africa. Very cool, Simon? Uh, Simon Jones, I'm the Head of Platform Engineering at Man Group based in London, England. Very cool, Kai? So Kai Walter, Carl Zeiss Group uh, based in Germany. And then Stefan? Uh, my name is Stefan Jäger, I'm with Bosch and I'm also sitting in Germany. Very cool. I was actually born in Germany, in Frankfurt, so I, I, I love going there and having a good time and, and, and hanging out. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and play favorites, and I'm going to start with the people from Germany since I was born there. I want to start with Stefan and say, tell me about your experience of adopting Dapper. Like, What was it that drew you to Dapper, and how have you been able to use it in your applications? And I'm going to ask everyone this question around mm -hmm. the panel. Okay. So um, actually, we jumped on Dapper like Quite early, I think it was uh, 0.3, the version that we jumped on. And um, what brought us to Dapper was like a Microsoft um, solution architect that um, we were in discussion with in regards to having a distributed system and uh, adopting an event-driven architecture. And this is where we also learned how Dapper could help us uh, on that journey. And um, yeah, we had regular sessions also with the Dapper guys. Uh, trying to shape a little bit what the PubSub component is doing. And um, I think we learned from each other quite a bit. And um, this year we uh, went live with our application and with Dapper 1.0 and have been yeah uh, updating since. Oh, and, very, uh, very yeah. cool. Awesome. Uh, Kai, how's your experience been and what kind of drove you towards Dapper as well? So we basically started off last year in spring. Um, we wanted to replace a uh, auto processing system which is based on a monolithic uh, system architecture and bring it into a globally distributed uh, microservice architecture uh, also with a redundancy uh, um, in, uh, designed in um, so we knew uh, um, that we need to needed to support various uh, processing steps in in auto processing uh, in synchronous and in asynchronous so we knew okay we had to support uh, pub sub and uh, service invocations. We knew that we had to keep uh, auto processing state um, concurrent uh, around the world. Um, uh, we knew that although the majority of, of the system will be done in .NET, we knew that we uh, had to incorporate uh, other languages like Java. And uh, around the time from previous engagements, uh, I was contacted by Mark Fussell. Um, uh, we got to learn uh, the Dapper team um, and uh, saw their uh, saw their engagement, uh, saw their uh, commitment, and uh, started a journey. And we also went live or in production with uh, Dapper GA, and also we are updating since and uh, um, running the the application in production. Awesome. So we're going to come back and double click on some of that. But before we do, Simon, I was really glad when I saw your session because you're not using Dapper like everyone else. Like or I would say that that everyone else traditionally thinks that they're supposed to use Dapper. You're using it on VM. So can you tell me a little bit more about how you adopted Dapper and what, what your motivations were? Yeah, so um, we've got a proprietary trading operations platform that's primarily written in .NET and is consisting of many individual services, but we've developed and maintained this over many years, and we incrementally improve it to maintain the existing investment. And it's a, as a result, it's a wide range of framework versions, languages, technologies, um, whether it's .NET, but other teams developing in Java and Python that interact with it, but it is primarily hosted on VMs. We deploy the services as Windows services example in many cases. Um, and we're always looking for ways to incrementally add features across the whole thing that are compatible with all of that. And we actually came across Dapper, I think it was during Mark Rosinovich's talk at Ignite in 2019, was it? November 2019? And what drew us to Dapper was it's a consistent way of adding features to all of those services because it uses the HTTP and GRPC interface and is written in Go and it's cross-platform. So we could add service discovery to everything, uh, eliminating the need for DNS aliases, distributed telemetry, the encrypted communications, the 
HTTP and gRPC calls with OAuth support, you know, a forward thinking communication technology and even application features that we don't currently have, like virtual actors across the primary languages we use, Java, Python, .NET. And then there's all the other things that it adds, like pub, sub, state management, things that we've yet to leverage, but we know that by using Dapper, we'll have a consistent platform that we can use to add features now in the, for things that are a bit older and everything going into the, into the future. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we're going to come back and talk about that incremental adoption, what it seems like you're, you're, you're alluding to a little bit, which I really like. But before we do that, Russell, uh, give us a little bit of background on your adoption of Dapper and what kind of drew you to it and, and how it's been helping you. So um, we, we, again, we started with Dapper very early in the process. Um, we actually worked with um, the Mark and Yaron's team in Redmond, and um, very early on we contributed one of the um, the bindings because we were connecting to Azure storage queues, um, cool. and we needed that, so we added that code. Um, we, we were driven to use that because we were looking for something that was very, very scalable. Um, we were looking at using Kubernetes, and there was lots of really neat features that we liked in there, particularly around service discovery by convention. Um, we, the system we were building, we were looking at very lumpy workloads that we 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 knew we'd have to scale. So we we've one of the applications we've built is is a billing platform, and the the invoice runs we need to scale up from one service most of the month to like you know twenty services on the on the invoicing day and that kind of thing, and and it and it fitted in very nicely. Um, we also were migrating away from a quite an old monolithic application. And we were looking for something that we could kind of surgically modify parts of the solution um, just by redeploying very small services. So in our production cluster now, which we've had going for about, I don't know, 12 months, I guess, um, because we, we went into production with like version 0.3 or 0.4 or something. Um, and we, we've got about 100 services running in that now um, uh, managing this platform. And, and the ability to, to deploy one, to do an upgrade, is really key to where we're driving the systems. Awesome. So yeah, I, there's a couple things I want to double click on, but we're already getting questions from the, the audience that's watching live. Kendall asked, uh, and this is a really good question, and I, I, this is for everyone on the panel, and feel free to double click on this. But the question is, what has been the busy, biggest technical challenges that you faced as you adopted Dapper? Uh, so I think that's a really, this gives them the real world, like this is what you can expect if you were to go through this journey. So anyone feel free to share if there were any technical difficulties and how you overcame those um, to use Dapper. Who'd like to go first? Yeah, maybe I can go first. Like sure. uh, we, we, we jumped on it like quite early. And I think in the early days, it was like tight coupling still with the SDKs and the runtime version. So we, we struggled there, uh, but these were like the pre GA days. So these topics are gone uh, once we, we reach GA and uh, we now have uh, backwards compatibility when it comes to SDK and the runtime. Um, I think like Dapper is pretty agnostic for the PubSub topic. Nevertheless, I think it's more or less um, a, a mindset topic to come into the event driven uh, topic. So it's not even a, a Dapper topic, but you have to, to to adapt your your coding style and your mindset and your design to really adopt uh, event driven. And then the other topic, uh, what we also adopt is like the virtual actors. And this is like similar, uh, like it's uh, not to blame on Dapper, but it's uh, it's also concept. It, it's a different concept, and you have have to get used to it. And um, that's it's not easy. And um, yeah, so it's nothing to blame on Dapper here. It's that the, the usual complexity that you have when you're in IT projects. Yeah, when you're trying to do microservices, I, I know I had experienced this as well, is that there's this bit of intimidation on all the things that you don't know that you don't know yet, right? How do I do service-to-service mm, yeah, service yeah. invocation? How do I make sure that these are all scalable? How do I do pub sub? And do, do I have to pick a particular broker? Right? Do I have to go ahead and bet all of my chips on RabbitMQ or can I switch over to Service Bus? And what Dapper did for me was just like, ah, Donovan, stop worrying about that stuff. Right, Because we're going to take care of all that for you. Just go have an amazing F5 experience on your dev machine. Use whatever's closest to you. And then we're going to make sure that that continues to work for you in production. So as you pointed out, actors, it's just a weird concept if you've never used it before. And you kind of got to wrap your head around when should I use this? And we provide that for you in any language if you want it. So mm -hmm. I think it's really nice for you to dis distinguish between what was truly 
a technical barrier for dapper adoption where there really hasn't been many, especially since it's GA, versus just wrapping your head around distributed application development and those challenges that are innate there as well. So does anyone else want to double click on any of the technical challenges you might have had when you yeah. first started adopting it? So for us, it was the global distribution because back at that time, there was no concept for that in Dapper. So basically, we had clusters around the world on, on, on several, uh, several geos. And uh, to, to reach global distribution, we had to loop back to a globally distributed API management instance. So when, whenever we wanted to shift workload to another region, we basically loop, uh, looped over API management. So this was uh, something uh, uh, that has to be solved. And uh, then the other thing, uh, back then, Dapper, the only suitable uh, hosting option for it was Kubernetes. And mm. so we had to bring up uh, uh, the team to, to Kubernetes speed. Yeah, we did not use it in, in that stretch so far. So that was also a, a, a challenge to go along. But it's not directly related to Dapper, but we had to deal with it. Yeah, and that's another thing that I loved so much about Simon joining the panel as well, is that it kind of breaks that that misnomer or that that misinformation that you have to be containerized, you have to be running inside of Kubernetes. None of that is true. Like you can run Dapper on prem, you can run it on VMs, you can run it on the edge. Dapper has no dependency on containers or Kubernetes in any way, shape, or form. But it works just as well there as it does everywhere else, which I think is a really good point that I hope everyone takes away from DapperCon is that Dapper is awesome, regardless of what language you program in or what platform you target, it's simply going to make your life easier when you go forward. So Simon or Russell, did you have anything else to add to that? Uh, sure, I can add to that well, quickly, well, actually. Um, <laughs> we'll go, we'll go with, we'll go with uh, Simon first, and then we'll get to Russell. Go ahead, Simon. Yeah, I was just following on kind of what you said there, is that um, for, for Dapro, the, the biggest challenge for us initially, because we had a very targeted set of things we were looking at, we wanted service discovery, we wanted uh, the distributed telemetry, but we also wanted a seamless development environment, a seamless experience for the developers. We wanted our .NET developers to literally just run Visual Studio like they always do, and to Dapro seamlessly come up in the background as an executable that's managed almost like a DL. They shouldn't even know it's there half right. the time. You know, that's a deployment challenge. Right. Um, and so that's why we we spent, again, with some of the early versions, not quite as early as some of you guys. It's like you guys have been out from the beginning with like, deploying it. But once it became suitably stable from our point of view, then we started looking at all the command line options that Dapper D itself, the daemon used under the hood, and learned how to launch that outside of the CLA, outside of a pod. And that's why we created the Sidekick component that we open sourced. And with that, our developers can literally just run Visual Studio now, and we will bootstrap and configure and launch Dapper and manage its health under the hood. And that eliminated the main barrier for adoption for us outside of Kubernetes. And it's a seamless experience now. Awesome. It's, uh, it's, it's a great tool. Awesome. Dapper Russell? is what it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Dapper. Yeah, I'm going to come back to that in just a second. But before we do that, Russell, what did you want to add? So yeah, I mean, one one of the initial issues we had was actually getting developers' heads around microservices and how they mm -hmm. did the debugging. And um, initially, we, we span up a, a micro Kubernetes cluster for each of them, and they were playing around in there. And there was obviously there was an issue with we're a .NET shop, and there's a lot of boilerplate to to build around it. So um, the first things about the debugging we kind of solved by um, once people had a bit of experience of it, they just tested at the service level. So we no longer needed kind of to to run three or four, five or six services on your machine. However, people just work on a single service, deploy it into the test cluster, and you're kind of up and running. And we only have one test cluster now between a whole bunch of developers, and that worked really well. Then the other thing we found with the .NET development was building up all the boilerplate necessary um, to, to build a microservice in terms of connecting to um, Azure configuration and different connections things to test and production DBs and all that kind of stuff. And we and we solved that by building a Visual Studio plugin, um, which is available on the marketplace. And you just click on that and it generates you the entire microservice, including all the YAML files and all the Azure pipelines in one go. And so you can click on a button, generate a service and deploy it. Um, and you're done. And that really reduced the friction of the development times. Yeah, fantastic. And and I, I, I talk to people about that all the time. It I, I focus so much being a developer for so long is that I, I need that F5 experience to be like as low friction as possible. I, I don't want to know anything about Kubernetes if I don't want to. We all know we have to run there eventually, but none of us actually wants to touch it. Like none of us actually want to have one running on our machines. And Dapper gives you that level of abstraction that lets me just run it locally 
with a confidence that it'll run just as well when I containerize it and run inside of Kubernetes, which I think is is my fa one of my favorite features about it. And I, I want to double click on something that Simon said. He's like, you, what was it about Dapper that made you say, I want to go make the investment into Sidekick, right? Because you could have looked at it and said, you know what? Like, we can find other ways to solve these problems. There were other ways to solve this problem. But what was it about Dapper that drew you to it and said, no, 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 like, this is the answer that we need? So I'm going to go invest in Sidekick to make it easier for my .NET developers. Yeah, it's interesting. There are other solutions out there for doing some of the things that Dapper does. Mm -hmm. um, and you could look at multiple different components that might do similar things, whether it's service discovery or acting as an L an L7 proxy or something like that. And if you looked at the time we were looking at Dapper, certainly there was there was nothing on the Windows platform necessarily uh, that would give you the same sort of service discovery and distributed solution. Everything in one component is just one unit that has everything in it. And it's just one thing you have to deploy. Because bear in mind, we're not in Kubernetes, we're not in pods. So we're going to limit the number of things we have to deploy along with everything else to minimize the number of components we share. Um, Dapper gave us this really nice abstraction layer between and all these different things it might add in the future where we just got a, a unified, consistent interface that we talk through over HTTP or gRPC. And we can swap out certain things. So whether we're in debug mode look on a local machine, we can have a local environment with local components running on there in containers. Then we can deploy it with a different YAML and point to production systems on the various environments. And it's just a configuration change, but we're only deploying one sidecar. And it does have, yes. we can have MTLS running locally, but not anywhere else. And because of the way we did it with Sidekick, then it's, the, the, it's just all packaged up and run in the same way. And all we have to do is change configuration. So when you look at the number of different things that we're running it across, the number of technologies and languages and platforms and historical stuff, it's, uh, I, I think, and with the virtual active technology as well, across those, the main programming languages we use, I think it's quite a unique proposition. Great. And I also noticed that listening to everyone speak, no one appears to be using all of it. And, and I, want, I want everyone that's watching this to understand that you don't have to, right? If, if all you need is PubSub, uh, trust me, we're going to make that easier to use than if you were to go take a hard dependency on any particular backing service, right? If you only need state management, it's still going to be easier to solve it with Dapper than to take a hard dependency on a particular API or a particular cloud vendor. It being agnostic, and there's a repo I'll share afterwards where I do demos very similar to what you were talking about, Simon, that prove that I can go from AWS to Azure to local. Right, and all I change is configuration, and not a single line of code changes, and it all just works. And that value proposition, with so many customers being multi-cloud, uh, with so many customers wanting to run the same workload on the edge as they run in the cloud, like that abstraction to me is just like that. That that's magic sauce that makes Dapper so powerful. So for the rest of you, like Kai, for example, what was that initial feature, or that initial thing that got you so early on? Because it sounds like you've been with Dapper from the very beginning when it didn't do all the crazy stuff that it does now, what was it that drew you to Dapper the first time? So as I said, uh, the, the way I could mix uh, asynchronous and synchronous processing, meaning pops up and um, method invoca invocation with the same code base, uh, with the same inputs, with the same outputs, not changing code, just changing the way, um, way of invoca invocation was very good and then but it turned out very very soon that actors is the key that we need yeah because we had some certain states like uh, if you think about the auto processing system we have to give a globally unique order number yeah each order needs to have a globally unique numerical order number so no GUID uh, stuff uh, doesn't count and so we had to find a concept where we basically share number ranges across the world and keep state on those number ranges. And there the combination of uh, actor state and the Cosmos DB helped us really to solve this, this puzzle uh, very easily. And what I wanted to touch on also, um, uh, coming back to the developer experience, the developers on their own machines, they could use simple services like Redis for pops up and mm -hmm. state and whatever. Yeah? But when deploying, we just changed the configuration and uh, we went with the cloud services like Azure Service Bus or Cosmos DB. Yeah? So same coding, no changes, just uh, just a change of the, the configuration. Awesome. So we had another really good question from the people who are watching live. So keep your questions coming. We're actually trying to get to as many of those questions as we can. The question comes from Harry. And the question is, which, what is the biggest capability that you would like to see in the future? So now that you've been running Dapper for a while and, you, and you've been solving real world problems and running it in production, what is a capability that you would like to see added to Dapper that you think would 
be a good addition. So, so for us, clearly, one of the big problems we have is scalability. And if there were some kind of generic patterns that were available in the infrastructure to do kind of auto scaling, so you could designate a, um, a particular service um, as one that could be scaled out horizontally um, across the cluster without really having to get into any deep knowledge of how Kubernetes ah, works. So if that I was see. kind of kind of built into the, um, the the Dapper annotations even, so the way you deployed it things, that the um, Dapper would do the right thing and, and have some scalability pattern built in there for you. That kind of stuff would be great. Because one, one of the things we do is we, we now have a, a pattern of a, of a master service. And if it's doing lots of processing, it's, it's instead of doing the processing itself, it sends the message to a queue, and then we spin up a whole batch of kind of other services that read off that queue, so we get 20 of things processing it. And I think it's those kinds of those kinds of patterns we would like to see kind of off the shelf, so that, again we don't have to write that code, and it's part of the framework that would make the um, you know the dev's life a lot easier and make the whole thing more consistently manageable because then you get standard telemetry and all that kind of stuff about it. Yeah, it kind of goes back to that we all know we're eventually going to be in Kubernetes, but none of us want to actually touch it, right? So you're wanting yeah. us to give you a level of abstraction that says, hey, yes. go tell Kubernetes how to scale this thing. Kata might be another project that actually came from incubations as well that you might want to look at because it's an okay. event-based auto scaler that could look at that queue and automatically scale that out for you. And because we're already going to inject all the sidecars for you automatically, like that would kind of start to happen, right? So uh, look up Kata when, when we're done. But it looked like some other people kind of got excited about that question too who wanted to yeah. comment. Yeah, uh, may I? Okay. Yeah, please. So uh, what, uh, one of the nice things with Dapper is really that you only take a dependency on one framework. So for PubSub, uh, for state, for actors, for uh, method invocation, for secrets, for telemetry, you take a dependency on, on, on one framework. Yeah. And the only thing what is currently missing for us is app configuration. So we are participating in all those uh, discussions. But what we want to have also abstracted in Dapper is app configuration so that we can also run feature flags and stuff over Dapper mm -hmm. and also be cloud agnostic uh, with, with this uh, aspect of uh, the application. Fantastic. That, that would be nice, I think, yeah. Mm. Anything else you wanted to add to that, Stefan? Or is that? Uh, yeah, I think we also had some uh, discussions about like blue green deployments, but on uh, AKS level, like on cluster level. Um, but yeah. Could, could yeah, at, at some yeah. at some point, I, I wonder like we can't have it fix everything. Like there's yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll add to that as well because I was going to say the same thing that traffic shaping because it's acting as an L7 proxy, then traffic shaping, especially when you got like multiple services, you might want to have a way of directing your traffic to one thing. And bear in mind, we're running outside of Kubernetes. We don't have an Istio or something like that or, or an Envoy. So being able to say, I want to direct traffic to a certain instance to do a blue-green type deployment, I think that's an excellent point. And there's an extension of that as well, and that is if you're doing development of a service and you want to debug into a cluster that's got everything running in one place that's already deployed, it'd be great if you could start up a Dapper instance and you could somehow direct, let's say you've got 10 instances of a service and you're debugging just locally and you want to start an instance of direct traffic just to that one rather than console balancing it across all 10 instances automatically through service discovery. It'd be great if there's a way you could put something in the headers in the traffic that's coming out from one service saying, I want you to go, please, when you go to Dapper and Dapper interprets it saying, I want to go to this machine. So you receive specifically that traffic you want to debug as part of the testing. At the moment, you've got to hit like a service like 10 times to get one message completely you've got 10 deployed and you're running an instance yourself outside of it so it's easy to start that to connect to a secure cluster and actually with with the right credentials so you can receive traffic but having to wait many times depending on how many services you've got deployed it'd be great if you do things like that but again this is all about traffic shaping i think that's something that would be really awesome if we get something like that into dapper very very cool so uh, russell mentioned something about scale but stefan you you're running dapper at at massive scale at Bosch. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you're doing some of the scaling work that you're doing with Dapper and, and what, you're at, what your solution looks like when, from a scale perspective? Um, yeah, I think actually, uh, like similar to the session we just saw, like we're following like the Dapper recommendations for HA setup and it's, uh, this is working fine for us, like for the, for the runtime components. And um, all the other all the other things are then um, again like uh, traffic dependent, so um, we have auto scaling in place, and uh, I think we don't run into issues when it comes to our um, sidecars. I think that's gotcha. uh, that's fine. 
So I wanted to go talk to Simon for a second because you're in a kind of regulated industry. Um, so was there any challenges being able to use Dapper in a regulated industry or has it actually been uh, pretty smooth sailing and, and something you were able to do? Um, I think the main thing that in, a, in our industry is we tend to move quite slowly and cautiously. So the platform that we have, because it's been developed over time so much, it's one large platform with a number of interconnected services. As we're regulated, then we have to um, we have to we have to trade and report transactions in a very timely way. There's a certain time limit you have when you have to report things. Otherwise, um, you know, you breach regulations in that industry. And we can't afford for any of our services to become unstable for even the shortest period of time. So we're very cautious about what we what we deploy. Um, and as a result, you know, with Dapper, if anything, we're actually just taking our time with it. We're not rushing. So we haven't had too many problems using it in our regulated environment yet because we are taking a cautious approach to, to rolling it out, shall we say. Um, the one thing I'll say is that the great thing about Dapper, though, is we can add it, all of our services independently with virtually no impact on those services. We can just route traffic through it. We deploy it along with it. It's the lack of risk of using something like Dapper rather than um, changing your service to modify its logic or to add other third-party libraries into it. Uh, that is one of the most attractive features from that point of view. No, for sure. Um, Russell, I saw you nodding in, nodding in agreement. Are you faced with some of those similar challenges or was your experience slightly different? Um, no, it's slightly different, but one of the things that, that we have in terms of a challenge is that we we want to add, if you like, new aspects to our application. And historically, that's always been done by configuration. So, um, and you get these dependencies between the components. And uh, we, we quickly realized that using the, the, the very straightforward service discovery in Dapper, you're just changing a URL, um, we named the components with the name that the, the upstream one wanted to find. And so it dynamically builds the target. So um, that way we, we can add in new functionality by deploying a microservice with the right name without changing any of the upstream components. So again, it means it's a very safe way of doing modifications to the entire system because it's kind of, you don't do any harm. You put in a new, uh, you put in a new service, it's completely independent, and then you introduce the name of it way upstream, and the, the data just flows down, and the service that wants to find it goes, I want to speak to you, and, and it sends the data across, and it all just works without having to have this configuration, that configuration, configuration, you make sure you've got the right version of all the services. We just don't get that issue anymore. So it becomes a very safe environment to deploy new services into. Yeah, that's One of the neat features so actually you guys have done recently on that is that the change to bring over the feature from the gRPC proxying, so the HTTP URL now doesn't have v1 slash method slash all of that stuff in it. You can just use exactly the same and just change the DNS alias. Uh, it's such a thing like that. that was, that's a real benefit. No, I completely agree. And um, yeah, I completely agree on that. It, it's, 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 it's just making it easier and easier. I think the more experience we get having customers like yourself use it in production is kind of driving the way that we're going to be modifying it and making sure that it meets the needs of our customers who who are running there and in production and one of the things you kind of reminded me of russell when you were talking about the configuration and this is something i didn't know when i first started using dapper is that you can actually configure multiple of the same component so i can have five different state stores all pointing at something different. So if I wanted to adopt a new state store, it doesn't mean I have to tell all my existing services, you all now have to switch over to this new state store. I can literally just drop another component with a different name configured to a different state store and have certain services just use that one as we slowly start to adopt across. So uh, I think that's something that for some reason just didn't pop to me when I first started using Dapper, but it's really cool to know that you can have four different pub subs and you can have four different state stores and you can have whatever it is that you're defining, you can define multiple of those and then actually have your code choose which one, it, what path it's gonna take through your, through your configuration, which is fantastic. And being a DevOps guy, I love configuration because I can manipulate that as I go through the pipeline, right? Nothing's hard coded, no code needs to change, but I can have my configuration for dev be different than it is for QA using the exact same backing services, but where they point could be drastically different, which is a really powerful uh, concept for us as well. So Kai, I see you you nodding your head there when we're talking about DevOps and running things through the process. Have you been using that same type of 
capability of modifying your configuration through your pipeline as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we have four stages and we run it uh, through DevOps. Um, although the, 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 the resource profile is the same on all four stages. So if we go into the cloud, we always use the same cloud uh, resources, uh, of course. Only We only have a variance to the dev machine. Yeah. Um, yes. But, um, we, we, uh, in the cloud, we use the same profile of resources. Yeah, very good. And I'd like to also, I'm, I'm one of those guys, if I'm going to be running in Kubernetes on, on the cloud, I, I tend to want to run Kubernetes at least as close to me as I can. I want to shift that left. And what I like about Dapper is that I can run it locally, or I can still containerize it and still run it inside of Kubernetes on my machine itself. And things like Bridge to Kubernetes uh, almost does what you wanted to do, Simon, right? Where you can actually say, hey, Bridge, I only want you to debug this one service that I have the source code for. I don't have the source code for any of the other five services that are running. And then what you can do is have Bridge connect to your Kubernetes cluster and route all of that traffic so that you're hitting breakpoints in your code while the other services are running happily inside of Kubernetes have no idea that you're actually debugging it live, which is cool. So the way mm -hmm. that you can actually integrate some of the other tools, I, I mentioned Kata as well, Bridge to Kubernetes is another good one that works really well with Dapper, to where debugging your Dapperized application doesn't feel different than debugging a, a .NET new application, because we have the Dapper extension that allows you to just add debug configurations to Visual Studio Code. And then we have Bridge to Kubernetes, which you might have seen a demo at KubeCon that Jessica Dean did, where it shows how she can literally just, it, it's the great analogy of taking your computer and just sticking it inside the cluster, right? Because like you're, you're now a component there and you're able to debug first class. And what I really like is how the community keeps adding this value to Dapper to where I don't feel like I'm doing anything special. I, I'm, I'm just getting all this value in the same experience that I had before. Have, how have your developers inside your organizations taken to Dapper? Have there been any any pushback to adopting Dapper that you had to overcome? I would say from our point of view, the, the whole sidecar idea is kind of new. Um, having an external process that you have to kind of bootstrap along with. I mean, under .NET, developers used to DLL sitting there and sure. they're seamless. You just add a package reference and away you go and you don't even think about it. But a whole separate executable that has to be managed alongside your existing process. That is, a, there was a sense of nervousness about that initially. Um, one of the development teams recently though just had a go at using what we developed as a combination of Sidekick and Dapper together. And I think they found it was a fairly seamless experience overall. So it's a case of getting that, getting that sort of knowledge uh, just distributed more, you know, through training and, and getting other people to use it. Um, overall, I think certainly from our point of view, the way we've come up with it is pretty frictionless. I think um, now, but uh, certainly that initial whole sidecar mentality, especially if it's not in a pod and managed for you, um, is something that certainly concerns some people. What did it, it's, it seems to be a, a reoccurring theme that Dapper isn't the problem. Right. It, it's mm. distributed application development. It's microservice application development, getting your because the sidecar pattern isn't something that we invented. Right. The sidecar right. pattern is a very common pattern. But had you not worked inside of Kubernetes before, you may have never heard of this thing before. And it becomes very foreign to think about why do I have two processes running when all I want to do is run my application. But I think once we're able to all wrap our heads around these these paradigm shifts, we start to really see the value that Dapper adds because we're not adding anything that you didn't already have already. We're just adding more value into that sidecar than it was there before. Yeah, I, I think uh, one challenge was uh, we brought in developers with various backgrounds, so uh, backgrounds with other uh, actor frameworks, uh, backgrounds like Azure Functions. Yeah, and as you said, you have to get your uh, head around it and to to do it the dapper way. Yeah, because in the beginning you tried the old way and try to somehow uh, squeeze dapper to the old way, but that does not work. You really have to give in and just uh, leave it up to the framework. Yeah, do it. Start as simple as possible. Yeah, the framework really takes over uh, all those responsibilities and then build up from there. I agree. I, I love this. Start simple. And again, it goes back to the fact that none of you are using all of it. And I cannot stress enough that you don't have to. Just um, use the part of Dapper that adds value. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, one, one thing I wanted to mention is like um, the uh, the Dapper promise is like um, yeah, you don't have to care about the infrastructure or uh, yeah, it's an abstraction layer also for the pub sub and for the state management. But um, yeah, also what what like uh, resonates or what what we get back from the developers is like. Um, Nevertheless, you have to care about the underlying infrastructure because mm. like there's the nitty gritty details that um, 
um, you actually have to know if you want to uh, set up a proper um, Azure service bus. You have to think about like that letter queues and subscriptions and and retries. And then when it comes to state management, you have to think think about um, uh, sharding of the database and stuff like that. So from from a, like a pure developer's perspective, it's easy because like. I talk HTTP to, to the sidecar and it's done, but like from an end-to-end -end perspective, like somebody has to care that um, it's actually working as expected. And um, so I think the, the promise is kind of fair, but you also have to look under the cover and you have um, have to be aware that uh, there's some 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 knobs you have to, to twist to actually get it somehow production ready. So, so one one of the things that I'm I still want to try with Dapper is the is the idea of um, kind of dynamic configuration at runtime using the the bindings, um, so that you can you can have a um, a service or a bunch of services that all do something independently. And, and where I want to really do this is is our machine learning environment, where you're you're taking data from one service and sending it to another one. Um, but the interface between them is just a queue, and you, you use the Dapper bindings to kind of do that at runtime. And, and now we've got Dapper into separate namespa separate namespaces. I can go and deploy these six services into that namespace, join them together with the bindings, and have the data flow all the way through. Um, but I'm, I'm getting a certain amount of, um, are you crazy from some of the developers <laughs> when I talk about it? Because they're like, well. <laughs> You can't do that. We can't test it before you deploy it, though. You know? So that's. But I think those sort of things make sort of um, a really super configurable system, and it's just something you really couldn't do without this kind of framework in place. So, I'll just add, actually, Jonathan, if I can, that I think, if anything, DAP has simplified things for us. So we were originally looking at at the time when that Ignite conference we came out when DAP was announced, we were looking at Service Fabric at the time. That was one of the things that we were considering, and we'd done some tests with it, and we did like the UI, and we liked all the failover and that sort of thing. But we were concerned that it's such a large, opinionated framework from our point of view for the few features that we wanted from it, um, and we're concerned about doing upgrades and you know that sort of thing and keeping it all stable. Um, and DAP has just eliminated the need for Service Fabric entirely, and we can do it all with independent sidecars. We've got our own placement at Sentry clusters, which are easy to set up and maintain, and it's massively simplified both the control and the data plane from our point of view. That's awesome. So I agree, I agree, Simon. Yeah, so we've actually had a large Service Fabric cluster at the, at the moment, and we're busy migrating all that off into DAP mm. at the moment, and we're actually using a lot less resources. The deployments are much easier and more reliable, actually, because you do it service by service, um, and you don't have that encumbrance of the kind of the service fabric. You will do it my way or no way, kind of. Uh, yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've gotten I've gotten Dapper to run inside of uh, service fabric too. So if you need to do that slow drip, you need to like kind of show them how cool this is. You can actually do things like secrets management in PubSub by just firing up the sidecar as a guest. Proc, and then it just works, right? So it's kind of cool so that you can kind of have them dip their toe into the dapper waters and realize how great it is and then just come yank them out of there once they realize how awesome it is to use dapper instead. Because like you said, easy is the best thing. When I first got introduced to dapper, I kind of looked at it sideways like, yeah, you can't do all that stuff you promised. Like there's no way it's this good. And then I wrote a component for it and realized, holy mackerel, like this stuff is really abstracted to a level to where it really makes my life easier. But I always look at it from the developer perspective. I want to go back to what something Stefan said, where there's there's more than just a developer involved in shipping software. But what I've noticed is that that religious battle we used to have with the operations team trying to tell me how it had to be done, which made my life as a developer hard because I had to then replicate that type of infrastructure on my dev, dev machine to have any chance of developing against it. Like we would have these really horrible meetings me pushing back because I can't duplicate that. How am I supposed to verify my code? And Dapper, again, kind of stands between the two of us and said, hey, operations team, go do the right thing in production, right? Go figure out what the sharding should be. Go figure out how to deploy that infrastructure correctly. Make sure you're doing what's best to scale your architecture. Donovan, relax, right? Just like go program against this ab ab abstraction, and I promise it'll work over here. So it's, it's kind of stopped all that friction that we were having when we're having these really big battles on, well, I need you to do it this way in production because I can't do it this way in development. And now it's like, don't worry about that. Do the right thing on both sides, have a great F5 experience, 
have the right secure, structured, scalable, resilient infrastructure. And then we're just gonna sit in between and make sure that this stuff continues to work. And it's been proving that true and true. And I love, again, talking to you all is very special because we're talking to people who have actually been running this stuff and of adopting this and living what we're preaching and can confirm that what we're saying isn't just hype, this is actual real and you're putting it in production. So I really do appreciate that. We have about five minutes left. Is there anything that you'd like people to know about your journey with, with Dapper that we haven't covered yet? Well, for me, we obviously we got involved quite early on, but the guys in the Dapper team have been just super helpful. Um, whenever we've had any issues, they've been right on the top. Um, I mean, with some of the releases, which obviously it was it was alpha, right? So there was a bit of flakiness here and there, but they they jumped right onto our cluster. They logged in and and helped us sort things out. And so that that really gave us a lot of confidence that it was going to end up being a um, a super resilient framework once they got it to GA, and, and it definitely has. I mean, we we've we've had no issues really, yeah, since like Dapper 0.7 or eight. Um, awesome. um, we've been running quite happily, and it's it's uh, probably the, the the best bit of our infrastructure that we've got in terms of resiliency and the amount of stuff that you don't have to do to look after it. That's yeah. fantastic. I can also say the same thing actually on the open source side of things. So when we when we were working with Dapper and we realized we wanted a service discovery component that wasn't part of Kubernetes, the 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 way that we were able to work with the Dapper team to develop the console component that we contributed and then also the um the psychic component we contributed ourselves. I mean Matt Man is very much in the open source world anyway. We contribute quite a lot, but this in, in our division, this is one of the first times that we'd actually done this way. And it was, the Dapper team made it really easy, really easy to, to develop and contribute the console component and work with them and invited us to do the community call for Psychic and that sort of thing. So it's been a great collaboration. Fantastic. Kai, you were going to say something as well? Yeah, so I just wanted to highlight that uh, the, the commitment the team showed, the Dapper team showed, really helped us gaining trust in, in the framework and also our journey. And I remember this meeting when we had a small issue, yeah, when uh, Jeroen was even, he was tracking down the issue during our meeting, during the phone call, 30 minutes, and even pull requesting it on the go. Yeah, and uh, it was really uh, a nice way of, of collaborating. Fantastic. Yeah. Stefan? I, yeah, yeah. All has been said. I think like Arthur and Yaron and uh, really they are very supportive and uh, up for calls, also looking into our clusters, uh, responsive on the GitHub tickets, um, approachable via Discord, like it's what you would expect. Yeah, it's or That's it's right. more actually it's more than you would expect. So it's That's really fantastic. Sure. Yeah, the Discord channel, for those who don't know, is a fantastic way to go get your questions answered. It's just a, a, a group of people who are just geeking out and really like this product. And you're getting answers not only from the, uh, the maintainers, but you're getting answers from fellow community members who just really like this and have already seen and solved that particular problem. So I encourage you, if you're not already a uh, part of that community, to definitely join the Dapper Discord. And the Discord is also set up during DapperCon to have a different channel for each one of the sessions that we've had today. So if you have additional questions that you'd like us to pose to some of our panelists, if you have questions for Cecil, Jessica, or some of the different case studies that we're gonna be doing today, you can go over to our Discord channel and in there will be a channel for each one of these sessions where you can add additional questions and we'll make sure we have some moderators and some community members in there who can help you address some of those questions in our Discord. Now, I also wanted to just thank the panel so much. Uh, it was really interesting and it's always fun to, to listen to people who have actually using a product that you're involved in. And it's kind of cool because everyone in the community can kind of share the same way that I'm sharing in on this because we've all kind of made a contribution. Like your code is helping everyone on this call be successful with Dapper and everyone who's going to adopt Dapper in the future be successful with it. Uh, I know I had a blast writing a component for it. It sounds like other of you have written components for it as well. And it's kind of like that kind of sense of pride to know that when Dapper ships, you're shipping with it and you help it make success, make it successful. And that's why we wanted to have DapperCon. This was really an opportunity for the community to kind of come together and say, in our way of saying, thank you so much for all that you've done for Dapper. And hopefully DapperCon 2 is gonna be talking about some really cool, crazy stuff that we've added since we spoke to you this time. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up. I wanna say a big, huge thank you to the panelists for joining us today. I know it's crazy times where uh, many of us are because this is a, a global community, but I wanna thank you uh, sincerely for joining us today. Thanks, Donovan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.